my name is Laurel Hart, and I would like to welcome you into my studio today. Um, my daughter Brittany suggested that I do a brief video um, sharing with you my supplies and my setup. And I thought, oh man, that sounds like the most boring thing I've ever heard of. But um, the very day that she suggested that, I received an email from someone saying, could you please show us um, what colors and uh, pigments that you're using on your palette? So here we are. And if it's too boring, you can turn me off. My studio is um, really, uh, I don't know, almost a sacred place to me. I, I feel so blessed to have this little place. It's very close to my home. I'm just about four blocks away. But when I come here, everything is turned off. My attention is all here on my artwork. And I share the space with a good art friend. So we bounce art ideas back and forth. Um, we've been in this studio space for about almost 20 years now. And the, there was a, a man that bought this area about, about that many years ago. And he decided to turn it into an art colony. And these old buildings that we're in are um, their old World War I radio headset factory buildings. So it goes a long ways back. And there's even kind of a little um, legend or theory that Philo T. Farnsworth developed his TV radio tube here in these buildings. I think Idaho might um, contest that, but um, that's something that's said about these places. So we're in a very creative setting here and I love my studio. The other thing that I wanted to say is it's not really a fancy place. Um, when I first showed my little space that I was planning to rent to my family members, my son said, oh, wow, this is perfect for an artist studio, old and crappy. And I thought, oh yeah, I could only see the old part and I, um, I don't see any of the crappy part. I love this place. Um, it's just got a really good feel to it. Um, so I, um, I, I wanted to suggest that you don't have to have a big glamorous space to do your artwork in. For years, I just painted in a corner of my basement, a little tiny room, not much bigger than a closet that had no windows. But um, the point is you just need a space where you can create. And now that I have this place, um, it's nice because I can leave everything out and um, I'm not, there, not bothered by laundry or phone calls or anything like that. So I'll begin a little bit telling you about my supplies. Um, I'm wearing an apron, as you can see, and it's um, not only for protection for getting my clothes messed up, but it's also um, useful for holding my phone, um, which is my music. So I have my music with me all of the time, and that's an important feature of my painting process. I also um, am able to keep my glasses and brushes and everything else in here too. So it's kind of a um, thing, a container thing for me, as well as a protective thing. Um, my palette here is, um, I used to use a Robert Wood um, palette, and I, I'm not sure if this is a Robert Wood palette or not, but it's a little bit smaller. And um, I like it because it's just a little more transportable. It, um, it doesn't have quite as many wells, but I seem to like a limited palette better, so it, um, it works for me. And it has a divided mixing space so that I've got um, an area on one side to mix my light um, colors. And then when I go into my darks, I kind of stay on the other side. Um, but if you like the bigger palette, that's great too. Both, both work as well. Um, my uh, colors, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily stick with one particular brand of paint. I like um, the Grumbacher Professional as well as the Winsor Newton. I use a lot of Winsor Newton. Um, they're, you know, a, a very reliable and um, good product. And um, the, the main thing with 
your um, colors or your pigments is to make sure you buy a professional grade brand of paint. Um, you're just going to frustrate yourself if you try to start out with a student grade and um, the, it just doesn't have quite the pigment power that a professional grade does. So I would strongly suggest that you stay with a, a professional artist grade paint. Um, the colors that I have um, found that I like the most, I try um, to keep a, a warm and a cool of each of the three primaries on my palette. But then I've branched out a little bit beyond that. But the main colors that I would suggest that you have for sure are um, a warm and a cool yellow. This is um, cadmium yellow, either light or medium. And then I've then this is a lemon yellow, or it can be areolan. Either either one of those colors is good. Then I have um, a yellow ochre on my palette, which I use a lot as well. This is raw sienna, another lovely yellow that I like. And then coming over here is a color that is a mainstay on my palette. It is um, transparent oxide red. And this color is um, not found really often in watercolor, but Daniel Smith is the brand that I have been able to find this color. If you can't find it or, or don't have it, it's similar to a burnt sienna, but it's just a little bit more transparent and um, leans, I think, a little more to the orange than burnt sienna. So I've, I've replaced my burnt sienna with this color and I use it either as a red or a yellow in a, in a uh, triad. Um, then my blues, I have ultramarine blue, which is um, the, the uh, darker blue that I use. And then I have um, uh, manganese blue, which is a little bit similar to cerulean blue. So if you don't have manganese, you could use cerulean blue. But again, um, manganese is much more transparent and mixes beautifully in um, with other paints. Cerulean blue is a little bit chalkier. And so I like the, the manganese. Um, I used to be able to get the manganese blue pure paint, but now they've only got it in a manganese blue hue, which is okay because it seems to even have a little more um, strength to it. So I, I like that. Then my reds, um, I've got a cool red, the alizarin crimson. And then my warm red is cadmium red medium. And I know the cadmium paints, um, we've had warnings that they are poisonous. I, I don't know. I've never eaten them or anything like that. And I've been using them for 30 years and I'm still here. So I just try not to touch them. I just try to be careful. Um, then um, I've also got cadmium orange on here, which probably should be over here with the yellows. But for some reason, I've got it over here. Then um, this is just uh, magenta or something when I need to get a little bit of a better pink. And then um, uh, the last thing on here is a gouache. It's a white gouache. And I have um, found that that is very useful for me in um, touching things up if I have missed a little bit of a white or something. I don't use it much, but um, I started to cheat just a little bit with that pigment and it's really been helpful. Um, I guess we're not cheating anytime we're doing something that improves our painting, are we? Um, brushes. Um, well, that, maybe I should say just a little bit more about my pigment. I keep my pigments just sprayed down with water. Um, I used to use distilled water. I've heard that it helps with keeping mold from forming on the paints, but I got tired of buying it, so I'm just using regular water. And then I have um, just my water container and my sponge. And the sponge, I really can't do without this because it regulates the amount of water that um, goes between my brush and the paper. And I, you know, I can blot off a, a lot of water or just a little bit of water there. 
as well as paper towel. Um, and paper towel is also useful for uh, lifting out. So it's not only just um, a good thing to wipe your brushes on, but I, I use it often on the painting itself in helping. Um, the brushes, again, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't scrimp on your brushes either. I would, I would stay with some good, reliable brushes, but I don't think it's necessary to buy the really expensive sable um, brushes. I, I haven't really used sable brushes myself, and I, I um, find that I don't think they're all that necessary. And maybe other people would dispute that, but the, the brushes that I'd like to show you are a, a brand that I, um, I was kind of, I kind of learned watercolor on. They're called Low, Low Cornell, and I have been buying them at um, the, the Blick store in my community. So I don't know if they're available there online. I think they probably are. But um, I just have had a set of these, and I just replace them as I go. You can see this little guy's kind of getting frayed here. But they're very durable brushes. They're not extremely expensive. And they, um, they have lasted really well for me. Um, so if you were going to buy these, I would suggest you start maybe with a, um, a 6, an 8, a 10, and a 12. And that would, that would be a pretty good starter set to get going. And um, uh, I think be a good, a, a good range of brushes that you would need. And, and these are round brushes. These are also eights. The eight is kind of my main workhorse brush. I use this um, in my paintings a lot, especially on a smaller piece, like about the eight by 10 or 16 by 20. Um, and so you see that I have quite a few of these number eights. I, I do go through these brushes. I don't really use a lot of flat brushes in my work, but I do have some. This one is just a, a one-inch aquarelle brush, and um, they're good for putting in sky washes and broad washes. But I've I've uh, come to like the um, Recab. I think these are squirrel brushes, and they're just a really nice mop brush that holds a lot of water. And um, you can I like them because you I think you can get a little bit better wash even than you can with a flat. So I do have a set of these. I ordered them online some years ago. I think they're probably still available, but uh, the Isabi Mop is a good one too. So uh, you can find several of these on um, any of the art online stores. Um, talking about paper, I mentioned in one of my videos that um, my my go-to paper for years and years has been um, Winsor Newton. Um, it's uh, 400, or yes, 400 pound, sorry, 140 pound um, cold press. And that, um, it's got a little bit of tooth, but it's not so much as a rough paper. And the reason that I I like this paper a lot is it's it's a real white paper and it also doesn't buckle as much as some of the other papers out there. So I'm not one that likes to stretch my paper. I just tape it down with good old masking tape. And um, with this paper, I have found that it, um, it will dry right back to drum tight, um, which is a really good feature. That paper, I think, has since been uh, ceased to be made, which has made me very sad, and um, it's just broken my heart. But this, um, they have been making some watercolor blocks in the Winsor Newton professional paper, which um, are still really good, but um, I do miss the full size sheets. I do miss the full size sheets of the, um, the watercolor paper that they used to make. So now when I need to buy full size sheet, I use the Lana Quarel um, in, a, in a 120, 140 weight and the cold press. And it's, it's been a good uh, trade-off. I've liked it just about as well. 
I don't think it's quite as heavy, but I do like it and it's worked fine. Um, so if any of you have a stash of Windsor Newton 140 pound weight paper around, let me know and I'll buy it off your hands. Um, okay, my easel. I, um, I bought this, purchased this easel. Actually, I've got one I can show here. I purchased this easel some years ago uh, through my local watercolor society and it just puts together like this with a little um, alternating thing that you can raise and lower and several um, a lot of you have asked me where I got this so um, that that's the sad story on that is I don't have a reference for you on that to buy that same easel but I have found um, another replacement that I think is really similar and really good. It's called a Symphony Painting, Drawing, and Book Stand. And um, it, I believe I bought this on Jerry's Artorama. But it, um, it does the same thing. It's adjustable so that you can put your paper on the front here. And then... The, the one feature that is kind of a little bit nicer about this one is that it has um, a thing that will hold your artboard on it steady. And so it's probably a little bit better made um, piece of equipment anyway. And um, it didn't, I don't think it was even over $20. So that's a good replacement easel if you're still looking for a good table easel for watercolor. My... Um, I just use the um, the regular masonite art boards for holding my paper, and as I mentioned, I um, I just tape it down my paper down with regular masking tape. It's not even a you know a special art tape really, and then. Um, and then, like I say, it will dry back to flat if you're using one of those good papers. Um, I keep several sizes of these um, cut pre-cut mats uh, so that I, as, as I'm painting, I can just kind of um, check the finished work and it just helps set off the watercolor. So I keep a lot of these just nearby my painting. So I thought I might mention just a, a little bit about my source material that I use. I do work often from my photographs, but they're always my own photographs. I, um, I'm, I know that uh, they have to be your own source material if you're going to compete in a competition or, um, or sell it, I think. So um, I'm careful to work from my own photos. But because they're such a, a big part of my painting process themselves, I thought maybe I would just mention a little bit about them. So I have a specific setting, usually, if you will, that I'm looking for in a, a good subject for me to paint. And um, generally, it will be um, a subject that is bathed in light coming from an angle coming from the side so that I get a really nice balance of uh, light and shadow, preferably more shadow than light. So I have really nice patterns of uh, the interplay of shadow and light. And I generally will just take the photos and then often I will run them through um, a program like Photoshop to simplify them even a little bit more so that they are, um, a lot of the detail is lost and it just helps me to be a little more conscious of the, the entire shadow pattern. Um, so these are just a few examples of, of some of these um, photos that I look for where there's a, a really good, um, strong light source on the subject Oftentimes, I, I love a dark background behind that is setting off that subject. And a lot of my work features this type of a setting. Um, and then I just have one of these little office Mac stands where I sometimes will just um, 
put my photo in there as I'm painting so I can just refer to it there. A lot of artists are um, just referring directly to their uh, iPads to look at their photos. And I don't know why, but I, I haven't done that a lot. I've, um, I've preferred to just have a, a hard copy of the photo that I can hold. And um, that seems to work better for me. And oftentimes, if it's just a four by six, um, I will just clip it to my board, as you've seen me do in some of my videos. Um, another helpful tool to have that I, I didn't mention yet, but um, a blow dryer for drying um, the different sessions of the painting, the first uh, wash in between the first and the last wash. So a blow dryer is kind of an essential thing too. And then just a quick mention of lighting. Um, I have in my studio, I have a really good um, light source. They're, um, they're, what are they? LED lights that are very bright. And it's just a, a much easier light to work with than... Um, you know, something like a fluorescent light, which I've worked with for a long time, and this lighting is so much better. And then I do have a standalone light right on my work table that I bring over and have it positioned right above my painting. I just like a really good light source on my painting. I can't think of anything else that I need to um, go over with you. I did set out um, my my uh, grayscale, my value scale, which I have promoted a lot. This is made by the Color Wheel Company, and it is, um, it is really a useful tool because it's got the little holes here where you can check your values right on your painting or at, in looking at your subject. You can just help yourself stay right in the value range that you're wanting to be in. Um, I hope that covers everything, and um, I have really, really enjoyed um, communicating with a lot of you um, about your painting um, pursuits and your, your dreams, and I really do wish you all the best as you continue on your painting path. Um, it's just really heartening and enjoyable to be linked together with this great love that we have of art and um, appreciating the beauty of life around us and um, it it just has given my heart a song to sing and I'm I'm grateful for this great gift in my life um, I'd like to just conclude though with a little quote that um, has meant a lot to me and I keep it pinned up in my studio all the time it's from an artist that I admire a lot his name is Richard Schmid and I think a lot of you may know his name but um, he has written a, a really beautiful book, and the very last paragraph of that book, he says this, Somewhere within all of us, there is a wordless sender, a part of us that hopes to be immortal in some way, a part that has remained unchanged since we were children, the source of our strength and compassion. This faint confluence of the tangible and the spiritual is where art comes from. It has no known limits, and once you tap into it, you will realize what truly rich choices you have. May each painting you do from that sacred place include an expression of great joy for the extraordinary privilege of being an artist. And I feel the same way about his words. It is just such a blessing to have art and the ability to create and show others what is in our hearts of um, the things that make us joyful in our lives. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you again soon.